MH370. The 55-day search that could rewrite aviation history. 55 days to scan 15,000 square kilometers. One week already gone. And the people monitoring this search are in a public fight about whether the vessel can even visually confirm what the sonar detects. What you're about to see is the technical reality behind why this search is fundamentally different and whether the timeline, the technology, and the evidence actually support finding the wreckage or just mapping more empty ocean. March 2014. A passenger jet vanishes mid-flight. 239 lives lost, no trace, until now. 12 years later, the world's most advanced ocean survey vessel races against a 55-day clock guided by a controversial radio-based method some experts call Ian Proven. What if the answer to MH370's fate isn't just in the data, but in how we read it? The consequences could redefine how missing planes are found, if these new clues really reveal the truth. Malaysia. Airlines Flight 370 lifted off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport at 12.41 a.m. on March 8, 2014. The Boeing 777 carried 239 people bound for Beijing. 40 minutes into the flight, at 1.21 a.m., the aircraft's transponder signal vanished from civilian radar. Military radar tracked the plane making an unexpected turn back across the Malay Peninsula, then veering south over the Indian Ocean. At 8.19 a.m., a satellite registered the last automated handshake from the aircraft. There was no distress call, no further contact. The plane never arrived. Search crews from Malaysia, Australia and China, joined by teams from the United States, United Kingdom, Japan, New Zealand and other nations, began a surface search over the South China Sea and then the Indian Ocean. The operation soon became the largest and most expensive underwater search in aviation history. Over three years, more than 120,000 square kilometers of deep ocean west of Australia were scanned using towed sonar and autonomous underwater vehicles. Acoustic pings thought to be from flight recorders were investigated and discounted. No wreckage was found on the seabed. In July 2015, a piece of the right wing, a flapperon, washed ashore on Reunion Island, more than 4,000 kilometers from the main search zone. Subscribe for aviation explanations without speculation. Over the next two years, fewer than 30 fragments believed to be from MH370 appeared on beaches across the Western Indian Ocean, including Mozambique, Madagascar, Tanzania, Mauritius, and South Africa. These finds confirmed the aircraft's destruction, but offered little clarity on the location of the main wreckage. Drift modeling using wind and current data helped narrow probable impact regions, but uncertainty remained wide. By January 2017, the tripartite search was suspended. The Southern Indian Ocean remained unyielding. The official record listed 4,383 days without resolution. For the families of those aboard, the absence of answers became its own reality. The search for MH370 became less a question of resources and more a question of where to look next. The search for MH370 has always depended on what the data could support. After debris began to wash ashore in the Western Indian Ocean, attention turned to drift modeling, using ocean currents and wind patterns to estimate where the aircraft might have entered the water. These models, run by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau and several international teams, narrowed the possibilities to broad probability zones along the southern Indian Ocean. Yet even with confirmed debris, the main wreckage remained unfound. The search area was vast, the uncertainties stubborn. In 2021, independent aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey introduced a new approach. He proposed that weak signal propagation reporter data, WSPR, a digital radio protocol used by amateur operators 
could be mined for anomalies caused by large metal objects, such as an aircraft, crossing radio paths. Godfrey analyzed WSPR logs from March 2014, looking for disturbances that lined up with MH370's known route while under radar surveillance, then extended the analysis into the ocean where the plane vanished from conventional tracking. The result was a reconstructed flight path terminating in a specific region of the Southern Indian Ocean, an area not prioritized by earlier searches. Godfrey's method drew interest for its technical ambition and controversy for its untested nature. To support his claims, he conducted blind tests using flights with known positions, reporting perfect accuracy in identifying both aircraft type and location. These results, however, were published in technical notes, not peer-reviewed journals. In late 2024, researchers at the University of Liverpool examined the WSPR approach. Their review found that Boeing 777-sized aircraft could, under certain conditions, create measurable disturbances in WSPR signals. Yet, they stopped short of endorsing any specific flight path for MH370, instead calling for further investigation into the method's reliability. The current search area lies about 1,933 kilometers west-northwest of Perth, within one of the probability zones suggested by earlier drift models. Subscribe for aviation explanations without speculation. Its selection reflects both the persistence of physical evidence, debris carried by the currents, and the hope that WSPR analysis might finally resolve the aircraft's last movements. The operation now underway is the first real-world test of whether radio path anomalies can meaningfully narrow a deep ocean search. The outcome will either reinforce the value of WSPR as a forensic tool or leave its role in aviation investigations unsettled. Armada 8605 departed for the search zone on January 3, 2026, carrying three Hugin 6000 autonomous underwater vehicles. Each AUV is built to operate at depths up to 6,000 meters, with a 5-meter length and a weight of 1,400 kilograms. In this campaign, the vehicles are being cycled through shorter missions, typically 12 to 24 hours, rather than running to their maximum endurance. This approach allows for more frequent data checks and equipment inspections, a precaution in a region where seabed topography is unpredictable and vehicle loss would sharply reduce search capacity. Within the first week, the team has scanned about 2,900 square kilometers of seabed. Daily coverage rates have ranged from 113 to 534 square kilometers, reflecting both the complexity of the terrain and the need to adjust for changing sea conditions. On January 3rd, one AUV developed a technical fault during its mission. The unit was recovered, inspected, and returned to active duty after repairs. No lasting setback to the search schedule. As of January 8th, improved. Weather has further stabilized operations, with significant wave height measured at 1.7 meters and wind speed at 8.6 knots from the southeast. The search area lies in water between 3,900 and 4,200 meters deep a zone that challenges both navigation and equipment endurance. Each AUV operates independently, following a grid pattern designed to maximize coverage and minimize overlap. After every mission, side-scan sonar and multi-beam echo sounder data are processed on board for rapid anomaly detection. Suspicious returns are flagged for closer inspection in subsequent sorties. The operational cycle is continuous, launch, scan, recover, analyze, and redeploy. Each step measured against the 55-day window dictated by weather and logistics. Every square kilometer mapped is a step closer to resolving a search that has spanned more than a decade. On January 6, 2026, Richard Godfrey examined satellite images and vessel photographs, identifying what he argued were two remotely operated vehicle systems on the deck of Armada, 8605. He pointed to gantries and support structures, claiming they matched equipment used for ROV deployment. Godfrey's interpretation suggested a search strategy designed for speed, 
If sonar picked up a promising contact, cameras could be deployed within hours, enabling almost immediate visual confirmation and, if necessary, recovery. Subscribe for aviation explanations without speculation. This would compress the timeline between detection and proof to a single operational cycle, minimizing delay for families and investigators. A day later, Jeff Wise and Don Thompson challenged Godfrey's reading. They scrutinized the same deck images and concluded the visible containers were refrigeration units, not ROV systems. In their assessment, Armada 8605 lacked the specialized winches, umbilical management, and control vans essential for deep sea ROV operations. Wise and Thompson argued the vessel was equipped solely for autonomous scanning, not for recovery. Any significant find, they said, would require a separate mobilization, either returning to port to outfit the ship with ROV units or dispatching a dedicated recovery vessel. This approach could stretch the interval between detection and confirmation from days to months. The heart of the dispute is the search contract. Malaysia's agreement with Ocean Infinity is a no-find, no-fee deal, with a payment cap of $70 million. The operational window is about 55 days, dictated by weather and vessel schedules. Whether this is a hard contractual deadline remains undisclosed, but the urgency is real. Each day at sea carries financial and emotional stakes, as the gap between finding and confirming wreckage could mean weeks of additional waiting. As of January 8, 2026, Ocean Infinity has not clarified the vessel's true capabilities. Both sides rely on open source data, not classified plans. The technical debate over deck equipment now shapes the pace and outcome of one of aviation's most scrutinized searches. 12 years on, the search for MH370 tests, not just new technology, but our appetite for uncertainty. Each scan confronts the limits of data and hope. As the world waits, one truth endures. Disappearance is not the same as closure. Let me know your thoughts below.